Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to associate myself with the comments of the gentlelady from Texas and the gentleman from Colorado that election security issues must be viewed as a bipartisan endeavor for us to be able to make progress and that all voters deserve to have confidence in that process. I must say it was a little disheartening that the chairman began the hearing by taking a bunch of partisan shots at the president. I don't understand how that is helpful to the work that we're doing here and really thinking in terms of the value of elections most broadly, I fear that the greatest risk to our democracy may not be hacks or interference with the vote. It may be the efforts by radical Democrats to try to impeach a president who was duly elected. That seems to undo elections a lot more than hacking. But alas, back to this important work of the committee. Uh, I wanted to thank uh, Congresswoman Murphy as the lead, but also our colleagues on the Judiciary Committee, uh, Mr. Deutsch and Ms. McCursal Powell from Florida for co-authoring H.R. 3529. And this bipartisan legislation requires the head of the Department of Homeland Security to notify state and local election officials in the event of some intrusion or hack. And so my question is really to any of the members of the panel to speak to the utility and importance of real-time coordination in the event of an intrusion and how you might see state and local officials working cooperatively and proactively with the federal government in such an endeavor. I'd love to take a crack at that. Uh, thank you, Congressman. Um, I, it's critically important, that collaboration at the state, local, and federal level. Um, and we saw it in Pennsylvania uh, last year, in November of 2018's election. We were connected across the country to other states and to the federal government, getting real-time information about things that were being seen in other, in other states. And we could not only take, so for example, there were uh, attempts to hack into, you know, to send DDoS uh, types of interruptions in other states. IP addresses were identified, passed along to other states. We then in turn were connected across the state to the 67 counties, could pass along those IP addresses so they could block it proactively before having to have, so that it was literally uh, in action collaboration that protected our elections. So and we, that kind of thing, both before, during, and after, is critical in order to make sure that we have the most secure elections possible. Congressman, if I may, in 2018, under the, uh, the direction of Director Krebs from CISA, there was a war room established at the federal level to which um, technology providers, state and local officials were all invited. We participated in that, and that was a good step forward. But what you suggest is absolutely critical. Uh, I agree that the, the more efficient we can have communication between all federal agencies who are aware of attacks in real time with state and local officials and also leading technology providers who stand ready to assist with this effort of protecting our elections, the better it can be. So we need to improve and expand on that rapid real-time sharing of threat information at the time of the election and, and before then. I, I agree with both and I, I just also add it's uh, critically important, I think, a good role for the government to create the environment where information sharing can happen uh, without restrictions um, in, a, in a smooth and precise and expeditious manner, such that everyone who needs the information can get it and is presented in a usable fashion. And I would not limit that to state and local and federal, as has already been stated. Um, vendors, you know, they're very good threat intelligence organizations that are, that are, that are doing a great job in um, uncovering uh, good information that needs to be a part of this dialogue. That is incredibly helpful advice, especially when I think about the experiences in Florida where, you know, hackers masquerade as the vendors. So they would seem to be an important part of that community, and that's very helpful. Uh, I would also observe that there, there seems to be some confusion in Florida as to the extent to which any hack could lead to voter manipulation in future elections, not based on changing the tallies of the votes, but by potentially manipulating someone's name. I'm Matthew Lewis Gates II, but if someone went and changed my name to just Matt Gates on the voter rolls, potentially I would have a hard time having my vote counted. And so this may be a broader question than, than you're able to answer, but I am interested, and I think the Judiciary Committee could perhaps partner with others on the utility of blockchain technology to 
enhance the security of elections because in an immutable, decentralized ledger, I would think that such a manipulation of the voter rolls themselves would be less likely. I, I would seek any comment anyone would have. I appreciate the chair's indulgence. I think there's great, there is certainly um, the opportunity for blockchain to be relevant in this space. Um, but if we think now about uh, the American public and their understanding of voting and voting systems, um, we are talking about paper ballots as a backup. And generally people understand that blockchain technology is very complicated and is untested. Uh, I know it's being tested in West Virginia, as I understand it. So I think there's a possibility, um, but it's not something that I think is ready for use for a general or primary election. Thank the gentleman for yielding. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I initially have a unanimous consent request that H.R. 3529, the bipartisan election security legislation I referenced earlier, be entered into the record. Without objection. Thank you. And I, I want to return to this issue of paper ballots versus blockchain technology. And, and I know that we all likely have a lot to learn on that. Um, Mr. Burt, do you view blockchain technology as potentially being more applicable to the voter rolls and the maintenance of the rolls and ensuring that there is no manipulation of those than to the actual vote itself? Or would you view the technology as applicable or inapplicable to those two silos of election data separately? So I think you do need to evaluate those two things separately because they really are uh, different problem sets, right? So you need to look at the problem set and what you're trying to address. And there's two different problem sets between voting where we don't think blockchain is a great solution for a nationwide election and the voter registration rolls where, to be honest, it's something I need to go back and talk to our, red, our, our experts about whether it's a potential solution. Offhand, I'm not sure that it is because, again, you don't really want, in the context even of a voter registration role, you don't want distributed a distributed ledger. You want a ledger with a leader. Why is that? Because you want to have someone who has the decision-making authority about what's a legitimate registration and what's not. And in, in, a distributed, um, in a distributed environment, that's being determined by every, every other participant in that environment. Now, there may be a way to make blockchain applicable to the voter registration process to help with this security issue. I want to go back and talk to our experts. But offhand, I think it's probably not the right technological fit. So, yeah, and my question, and again, I'm not asserting that it is. It's just very interesting me, to me that it seems to be less susceptible to manipulation because in the event that you had the circumstance you described where someone was attempting to manipulate the data, instead of us relying on one supervisor of elections, a Department of State, or even some of these joint task forces that I think we've very productively discussed today, you would have potentially thousands of different nodes and, and uh, capabilities to be able to diagnose that manipulation. My concern now is if you can essentially flummox a supervisor of elections, you can manipulate the voter rolls. And as I sit here today, having received the briefing that I know my Florida colleagues received, I'm not certain that in my state there wasn't some manipulation of the voter rolls, and no one's been able to reflect that certainty to me. And so I'm just trying to kind of democratize the oversight of that system potentially and so again I don't I don't expect anyone to be an expert on this I think we've got a lot to learn about it but I, I, I just reject the premise that only a piece of paper gives us a sense of a lack of manipulation I, I, I don't disagree with that congressman and if I may the, the like gentleman's to go back time has expired the witness may answer the question thank you chairman um, uh, let me go back and um, we come back, come back to you and, and answer the question more specifically about blockchain and voter registration roles, whether that or some other approach is the best means of securing those roles. Thank you. I yield back.